methods of genealogical research um, within my own family tree because it's always something that's really fascinated me. Um, I had two goals in this project. First, I wanted to research how an amateur like myself would study genealogy when it's such a broad topic and if you don't have a lot of places to start, how would you go about it? And personally, I have, on the paternal side of my family, I have a rich history um, and about the German side. And the story was that we came over from Germany with the last name Schmidt. And because they weren't allowing Germans into the country at the time, they changed it to Rocheski. And it was just a story, and I had no idea how true it was, and it was just something I really wanted to find out. Um, so as you can see, my plan involved a big bulletin board right there. I don't know if you could see it, you could probably come up later. But um, I would use Ancestry.com and stories from my family and pictures and everything to try and piece together my family history and along the way document how a normal person would go about doing that. So I signed up for Ancestry.com. It's about $77 uh, a month, uh, not a month, uh, $77 for six months, which is about 10 or $12 per month. And I thought it was a really great website. There are a lot of other genealogy websites available to people to use, but they all actually navigate back to Ancestry.com. Most of the data comes from Ancestry.com. They have basically any record you could have in the United States, come like census records, ship lists, immigration records, it's all there. And like they say, you just need to start looking, I guess. And they have a free helpline with genealogists there that will tell you information or help you navigate the website, which is really wonderful because I called a lot. <laughs> and um, they also have this program called Ancestry for Libraries, which I was really upset I didn't know about because my local library had full access to Ancestry.com and I did not know about it and I paid for a membership. <laughs> so <laughs> um, before, uh, I knew, before I started searching on Ancestry.com, I knew that I had a relative named August Roschesk who came over in Europe, probably somewhere in Germany. Um, I wasn't prepared for the fact that my name is not a real last name. It's supposed to be Roschesky, but my ancestors chopped off the I at some point. And so there were a lot of misspellings and censuses. Um, one of the common ones I saw was Roschwiski. And it was for months I could not find August. And I was so confused why I could not find him until one day it was just a typo. And yeah. <laughs> Um, from Ancestry, I learned a lot from the census data, which really helped me. Um, mostly the census from 1900 and 1940. I found August and his wife, Minna. And um, from there, in 1940, I found their son, Edward, and with his family and his wife, Anna. Um, I also found some other possible people who could be related to August, but um, I would never know for sure if they were actually related to him or not. And that was kind of frustrating because uh, you never have all the information, and there are all these people out there that I could be related to, but I really just don't have any clue. So these are the censuses. As you can see, there's, it's very difficult to read the handwriting, so months of this. It was fun. Um, so on the top we have uh, August, Minna, Edward, and Minna's mother, and on the bottom we have Edward, Anna, Gertrude, Edward, Leo, and then at the bottom is my grandfather. This was easily the most important record right here. This is August's naturalization record, which documented his immigration to the United States. And it was important because it showed the port he came in on and the date he came in, which was November 25th, 1890. And that led me to um, the Ellis Island website, which I searched on, but they didn't open until 1892. And so they suggested that I go to the Castle Garden website, which is in Staten Island, New York. And sure enough, I found August there. But, and it turns out that most of my family still lives in Staten Island, so we kind of parked and never left. And <laughs> this is the actual record. Um, as you can see, there's August, and he came from Grombin, Germany with about four other people, but I was never able to find them, which is something that still remains a mystery to me. Um, this is Grombin, Germany. It's like a small farming town on the border between Germany and Poland, and they traveled all the way across the country to the Bremen port. Um, one of the most important things I found out in this project was that you need to know your world history. I did not study the history of Germany before World War I, which is when August lived in Germany, and I found out that Poland didn't exist at that time. And where my ancestors would have lived was actually used to be part of Poland. 
but it became part of Germany before World War I. After World War I, Poland came back, but Gromben, Germany remained a part of Germany and not Poland, though many of the people who lived there were still ethnically Polish. So, I am not German. I am Polish. <laughs> um, so because of this, of course, I wanted a DNA test because I wanted proof that what I thought was correct. And so Ancestry.com offers a DNA test, and it's anywhere between $100 and $200, depending on when they're running the sales. And yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> and, um, so it's also very inaccurate. Um, I read a lot of articles online that told me not to do it, and Medical Daily said DNA tests are akin to genetic astrology, because basically one person three generations back has hundreds of ancestors, and it's impossible to pinpoint one specific track, and there's so much room for error, and our technology just isn't there yet. Um, after that, I interviewed my family members, and I sent out letters to seven of them, and I got responses back from five of them, which I was very happy about. Um, I asked them about personal information, such as their names, their birthday, their relatives, what they knew about their genealogy already, but I also asked them more personal questions, such as um, what their family vacations were like as a kid, what were some of their favorite memories, and things like that, and they were really fun to read. Um, my father's direct cousin, his name is Richard Zini, he's on that chart somewhere, um, he helped me so much. He sent me his whole family tree that he had done on his own, and I found out that he had already done a lot of genealogy work, which was really, really helpful to me, and he sent me a lot of pictures, and he was always really invested in helping me in this project, and I owe him a lot for this. Um, I learned a lot from the or oral histories. I think I learned a lot about my family and who they are, and what they like to do and how they acted around each other. I didn't really learn more about my roots, but it just became not important to me. It became more about learning about my heritage. Um, I spent a day in Staten Island with my family, which is where I got most of these pictures, and it was a giant shoebox of pictures, and they were all um, unorganized, undated, not named, not labeled. It was a nightmare. And um, I had to ask my great aunt, who's in the left picture, and they would identify people for me and they'd tell me stories about who was in the pictures and I think even though like who wants to spend five hours in Staten Island, this was the most fun part of my project. <laughs> um, these are some of the pictures I found. This is um, the one on the left most is a picture of Edward and Anna and their family. Um, this top one over here is actually my dad as a baby and my great-great-grandfather, and at the bottom, that's Edward and Anna at an anniversary party. I found about 80 pictures total, but I could only use a couple in this project or else it would go all night. <laughs> this is um, one of my favorite pictures. It's the only picture of Minna Strachfeld, who was August's wife. Uh, there were, I did not find any pictures of August. I wish I had, but it was really cool to have a picture this old as a part of my project. Um, a lot of the times the pictures gave me more questions than answers because we could not identify a lot of people in the pictures. Um, on the leftmost, there's a baby girl in Buffalo, New York. That's all the picture said from 1940, but we have no idea who it is. We have no idea whose baby it was. And in this one, this was a really big family portrait, but in the center is my grandfather and he's about six years old. So there are a lot of other more elderly people in the photo that we don't know who they are and my great aunt was unable to identify them even though she was in the picture. And uh, so I hope to find that out one day. Um, I think I really, this project was a huge learning experience for me. Um, I learned that you will never have all the answers and you need to accept that you will never have all the answers and sometimes it's okay to make conclusions and go with your gut. Um, I learned that you need family cooperation because they're the ones that give you the leads on where to go and where to start in your project. And having a general knowledge of world history is obviously very important because you might found out, find out that you're Polish and not German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, genealogy is more than connecting the dots. It's not even the most fun part. The most fun part is learning about your heritage and learning about your family and having a connection with them. And I think that Genealogy really gives us a more of a connection with the past and a connection with history. In my U.S. history class, um, I got the chance when we were researching uh, stuff from like World War I, and back then I really thought like about, oh, I wonder how my family acted during this time. I wonder what they were thinking, what they were doing, and it gives us the idea that these people were people and not just names on a page. Thank you.
Questions for Sam? Mr. Ekman. Mr. Ekman! <laughs> hey Sam, how did you organize all this information? Oh, on this lovely bulletin board that my advisor gave me the idea for. <laughs> And what was the bulletin board referred to as? What? Oh, it was referred to as the Homeland Board. <laughs> what? Homeland Board. Um, what made you decide to do your dad's and not your mom's? Um, my mom's side of the family is very hard to trace. She doesn't really know much. She knows like maybe one grandparent, and she didn't have a lot of family that we could ask about it. So it wasn't very accessible to me, and I have a lot of relatives on my dad's side that just love to talk about the family history and things like that. I have one more question. Um, in with your methodology and the technology, with, which obviously helped you be efficient, mm -hmm. to what extent did, did this sort of research have to rely on your uh, <coughs> determination and your problem solving, right? That, that, that sort of um, skill, not just method. Oh yeah, definitely. I think it takes like a lot of willpower. There were like days where I just had to like put in my head that believe that I was going to get a breakthrough because it's a lot like detective work and you have to like, it's something that you, you can't just do it casually. You have to really invest yourself in it or else you're not going to get very far. Yep. Thank you, Sam. Jasmine's <laughs> done.